Okay, I'm back. Technical difficulties. All right, let me just put a note here. All right, let me just give a couple moments. In the meantime, while we're waiting, just go ahead and comment hello and let me know where you're watching from. Let me know where you are watching from. Hello, say hello and tell me where you're watching from and whether you are in school or you're already working as an MA. Let me know, let me know. Hey, Tamia. Hey, Crystal from Chicago. Tamia is from Texas. Thank you, ladies, for coming over here. If you are watching this for the first time, we had some technical difficulties and we had to end the other live. And so this is a brand new video. Let me just go ahead really quickly. Let me just make sure I ended that other video. So in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, just go ahead and comment down below. Hello. And let me know where you're watching from. Let's see. Let me make sure. Okay, yes, yeah, so that other video ended. I'm going to have to make sure I delete that one. So that started. Let's make sure I delete that one. Okay, good. All right, so I deleted that one. Okay, so we're going to get it started. Praying, no, te ne no technical difficulties this week. So unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have to start over. So I see Jalen here is from VA. Alize is watching from Arizona. Tamia is working as an MA, just got certified today. Woo -woo. Congratulations, Tamia. Kimberly is from Venice. Thank you all for rejoining. Shadira is from Philadelphia. All right, so we're going to get started. So unfortunately, we got to go through some of this again for those of you that were already on with me for the first video, but it's okay. We're going to make, we're going to, we're going to get through this. We won't be on all night. All right, so I want to shout out Phyllis, Paulina, Rhoda, Lacey, Amber. J Hosan, Naturally AZ. Congratulations to you all for passing your tests. Um, Edie, Leo Kid got the highest score I've ever seen 480 because 500 is a perfect score. You got a 480 that is perfect. Um, Monica, Lapita, Shadira, Shanice. Oh, um, one person I, I caught just in time as I was preparing this and I was able to make get them in. Virginia, Evelyn, Monica, Charmaine, um, Miss Kimian, Kristen, Kazunu Kazunika. I'm sorry I'm pronouncing this incorrectly. Um, some of you all are passing your CMAA. Some are passing your CCMA. We got Sierra here, James, Joe Amber, Isabella, Claudia, Eddie and Sons. Congratulations to you all. Yasira, Yamalette. Elizabeth says she was like, what was Miss, what was Miss K? What would Miss K pick? That's hilarious. Maria. And then this person here, this was a message from Facebook that I wanted to shout out here. Um, as I mentioned on the first video, um, this person reached out to me. She had been going through a lot, but she pushed through. So I definitely want to give give her her um her props because she she has been going through a lot, guys. And I'm just so proud of her for pushing through. Um, because I know, I already know that it is not easy. All right. So let's go. Let's go. All right. So we're going to get ready to get started. I want you all, if you haven't already, go ahead and um, screenshot this. If you haven't already, the tips. We go through these every time. So you're already familiar with them. So the number one tip that I want to reiterate, I'm not going to go through each one. Number one tip that I want to reiterate is not to focus more on the question than you do on the actual content. I've been getting several emails and comments. Miss K, the questions are not on the test. I, I didn't do well. The questions were on the test or maybe I did pass, but barely because the questions weren't on the test. Do not look for the actual questions. For those of you who have not taken your test yet, or maybe you did and you're taking it again, do not focus on the question. Focus on the content. So that means when you're going through your study guide, Read over all the modules, read over all the material. When you know it, you know it. So it doesn't matter what kind of question you, you see, because if you know the material, then you then you know it, right? So it doesn't matter if it's multiple choice or if it's a fill in the blank question, right? If you know it, you know it. So focus on the content, all right? Again, screenshot this screen if you haven't already. All right, so let's go. Let's get into it. I accidentally went backwards. Sorry about that. All right, let's let's get into it. So which of the following should the assistant immediately report to the patient's provider? Is it going to be a glucose of 500, 
potassium of 4.1, hematocrit of 42%, or hemoglobin of 15. Which one of these answers is correct? Which one should you immediately report to the patient providers? Tamia says she flagged all the hard ones and came back to them. Thank you for mentioning that, Tamia. Um, yeah, so you get three hours for the test, right? And so three hours may sound like a long time, but three hours is not really a long time. It flies quickly. So you don't want to spend all of your time in the beginning on a hard test. You want to fly through the easy ones, right? Go through the easy ones, flag all the questions that you need to take more time on. So that way, you know, your time won't run out because if you spend all your time on the hard ones in the beginning, your time will run out. I have had students who said, Miss K, I literally got to the very end. Like I, I barely had a couple minutes left. So some people literally use their entire three hours. OK, thank you to me for um, reiterating that. All righty. So if you said blood glucose, that is correct. Potassium, hematocrit, hemoglobin, those are all normal ranges. And so what I want to do really quickly, I want to give you all um, these ranges, because if you see this as an option on the practice test, that means you will most likely see it on the test. OK, so I'm going to give you the ranges for these other um, 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 for the potassium, hematocrit and hemoglobin as well. Why? Because it's an option. Remember, in one of the tips I told you, if it's an option, then guess what? You need to study it. All right. So glucose should be between 70 to 110, okay? The range for blood glucose is 70 to 110, all right? Potassium, the 4.1 is normal. That range should be, for an adult, 3.5 to 5.1, okay? 3.5 to 5.1, all right? Hematocrit. The hematocrit level for a male is 42 to 52%. And for a female, is 36% to 45%. I'll say it one more time. The hematocrit level for a male should be 42 to 52%. And for a female, 36 to 45%. All right. And hemoglobin. Their range should be 15 to 17 for males and then 12 to 16 for females. Okay, I'll say it again. For hemoglobin, the range should be 15 to 17 for males and 12 to 16 for females. Okay, so make sure you write those um, ranges down so that way you know it when you see it. All right. Okay, let's get it. Okay, so when preparing a patient to wear halter monitor, which of the following instructions should the assistant include? You should avoid using an electric blanket. You can bathe and shower as usual. You will be required to wear the monitor for two to four hours, or you should avoid your regular exercise routine. Okay, so I'm seeing mostly A's there. All right, so let's see. Yep, so if you chose A, that is correct. You should avoid using an electric blanket because it can interfere with the halter monitor, okay? Um, bathing and shower, bathing and showering, um, um, you want them to avoid that with the halter monitor. With, with the halter monitor. C is going to be 24 to 48 hours. And then that time you want them to take like a bird bath because you don't want to get it wet. OK. And then D, you should avoid your regular exercise. Actually, a patient can exercise regularly while they are wearing their halter monitor. OK, so it's going to be A. They should not use an electric blanket while they have their halter monitor on. All right. OK. Which of the following actions should you take when using a butterfly method to obtain a blood sample? Hold the needle by its wings, insert the needle at a 45 degree angle, release the tourniquet after two minutes, or activate the safety device before removing the needle. You're using a butterfly method. 
Lovely line it says, been watching your content and want to thank you because you're so informative. Your videos really help watching from Indianapolis. Thank you, lovely line. It's, that's so good to know. You are welcome. You are welcome. It is shit is really my pleasure. You are welcome. Okay, I'm seeing mostly A's here. Mostly A's. All right, let's see. Guys, did you notice for those of you that's returning that that, that was with me on the last video? You guys noticed we were literally like, what, like 20 minutes in and hadn't even made it. It was moving so slow. We hadn't even made it to question two yet. <laughs> All right. So let's see. You chose A. That is correct. You want to hold the needle by its wings when you're using a butterfly method. OK, definitely not B, 45 degree angle. Absolutely not. It's going to be at a five to 10 degree angle or maybe even 15, depending on how deep the person's veins are, okay? Tourniquet, two minutes, absolutely not. Should be on for no longer than a minute. And then activate the safety device before removing the needle. That doesn't make sense. We got to remove it. We have to activate the safety device after we remove the needle, not before, okay? Yes, to me it says release the tourniquet after one minute. Absolutely. All right. Which of the following act? Oops, I went backwards. Sorry, guys. I right, which of the following terms should be documented when a patient reports that she saw blood? She saw blood in her vomit. Is it melina? Is it a uh, hemoptysis, hematuria, or hematemesis? Hematemesis. I'm sorry, hematemesis. Which is it? She saw blood in her vomit. Is it going to be melina, hemoptysis, hematuria, or hematemesis? Blood in her vomit. Okay, I'm seeing mostly these. I see a C. Lovely says she's taking her exam on 7-7. She's praying. I actually just got out of class and glad... Oh, I'm glad you caught it live too, um, Lovely. We actually just, we were on a whole other video and I had some technical difficulties. My, my computer was acting up. So I'm glad you made it too. All right. So let's see. I see mostly D's. Let's see. All right. If you chose D, you are correct. Hematemesis. So hema is blood right emesis referring to vomit so i'm guessing that's how you guys knew that because y'all were on it okay so um let's look at these other ones so um melina is a uh, used to document vomit um that has like that looks like a, a like coffee has a coffee appearance coffee grounds appearance um hemoptysis that is coughing up um blood and the hematuria that's going to be blood in the patient's urine All righty. Okay. If a patient becomes tachycardic and short of breath during a stress test and you notice abnormalities in his EKG rhythm, what action should you take? You're going to discontinue, instruct the patient to take slow, deep breaths, ask the patient if he's experiencing chest pain, or you're going to obtain the patient's vital signs. Okay, I'm seeing mostly A's. All right, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so if you chose A, you are correct. You're going to discontinue the test, okay? So even though these other um, options at some point, you know, you'll have the patient to take slow, deep breaths, You'll ask, you know, if he's experiencing any chest pain, obtain the vital signs. You'll do all of those things, but you want to first discontinue the test, okay? Because if you notice that the patient, tachycardic, meaning his heart rate has gone up, short of breath, and you're noticing abnormalities on the EKG, you got to stop it right away and let the provider know, okay? So you want to discontinue that test. 
All right. Oh, another EKG question. All right. Um, which of the following stages of the cardiac cycle represent ventricular depolarization? Is it going to be the T wave, the ST segment, the QRS complex, or the P wave? Now, I have had people asking me to do some, um, to do a, a EKG practice test. Some of you all are getting um, certified in EKG. I actually do not have access to that material, but you can go on the NHA website and uh, purchase that study guide and practice test. There, it is on the EKG. I'm sorry, it is on the, NK, in the NHA study um, um, website. So I, I do have a video of if any and if anybody have has any issues um finding study guides, I do have a video on the channel showing you how to utilize NHA to get the to the study guides. All right, so let's see. I'm seeing mostly C's here. All right, let's see. That's correct. It's the QRS uh complex that represents depolarization. So the T wave represents repolarization, ventricular repolarization. Um, the ST segment, that's the time between the end of ventricular contraction and then recovery. Um, and then the P wave, that's going to be the start of the atrial contraction or atrial um, depolarization. OK, so that is important to know. So the T wave, we say it was repolarization, ventricular repolarization. ST, we say between the, um, the time between the end of ventricular contraction and recovery. And then, um, of course, QRS is depolarization. And then the P wave, we said is atrial contraction um, or atrial um, depolarization. OK, so those are important to know in case you see the question written, um, written in another way. And this is this is the perfect example. So if you see what if it asks, you know, you don't see this question on there, but it asks, you know, which of the following represents, um, you know, the time between contraction and recovery of, of the ventricles. Right. Then, you know, it's the ST segment. So. This is why it's so important to make sure you're studying the content and not the questions itself. Um, Tamia says, I'm certified as a phlebotomist too. Are you doing any videos on that as well? So Tamia, um, I've been virtual for the last year and a half. I'm just about to go back into the classroom on in September for my fall classes. So I will do more videos, like actual um, clinical videos once I am back in the actual lab. So yeah, as far as the phlebotomy tests, I don't know if I'll have access to that because I don't teach the phlebotomy course. I just teach um, the phlebotomy section of the of the medical assistant program, if that makes sense. Like I don't teach, uh, we do have a phlebotomy program, but I don't teach that and I don't get access to that test, but I do teach phlebotomy within the medical assistant program. So I will have some more hands-on videos starting back in September because if you all notice, I haven't, I have not posted any clinical videos, and that's because I have not been in a classroom. I've been mostly virtual, and also um, we're back in a building now, but I'm teaching the administrative class, so I'll be back in the lab in September. All right. Which of the following microorganisms is caused by the Epstein-Barr virus? Is it polio, mononucleosis, gastroenteritis, or fifth disease? It's caused by the um, Epstein-Barr virus. And congratulations on being certified as a phlebotomist, Tamia. All right, I see A, I see B. I'm seeing a mix of A and B. All right, let's see. Okay, so if you pick mono, you are correct. You are correct. It's caused by Epstein Barr virus. Um, polio is caused by the polio virus. Um, gastroenteritis is caused by a rotavirus, um, and that's the inflammation of the small intestine and the stomach. And then the um, fifth disease that's a uh, mild rash that's caused by what's called a parvovirus B19. You're welcome, Tamia. All right, uh, okay. Uh, which of the following? Refer to ringing in the ears. Is it 
um, pars viscusis, um, autosclerosis, autalgia, or tinnitus, perspicuses, I'm sorry, ladies, perspicuses, autosclerosis, otalgia, or tinnitus, ringing in the ears. Okay, I see a bunch of Ds coming through. Okay. You're welcome, lovely. Okay, I see y'all are on it. If you chose D, you are correct. Um, Presbycusis, that's hearing loss, okay? Um, autosclerosis, that's an overgrown bone inside the ear. That re it does result in hearing loss, but it's an overgrown bone inside the ear. Atalgia is ear pain. Um, algia, keyword is algia. Um, that, that's one thing I want to mention too, is um, paying attention to certain um, you know, um, word parts within, within these words, that's going to help a lot. It's just being familiar with terminology because some questions you're going to see some things that some questions that you may not know, you know, you may not recognize any of the options, but you'll be able to take an educated guess by looking at the terms and being able to recognize certain suffixes and prefixes and things like that. So keep that in mind. And then tinnitus is the ringing in the ears. All right. Um, which of the following is the purpose of completing an incident report for a patient fall that occurred in the lobby of the clinic to remove liability from the clinic, to avoid future reoccurrences, to document patient responsibility for the fall or to create documentation for the patient's medical record? All right, let's see. Seeing a mix of B and D, so one A. An incident report. It's two options. We automate. Well, I, yeah. Well, I see you all. Let me go ahead and go to it before I talk about it. So I was going to say two things on there. I think we can automatically rule out. So this is a good example. When you guys see questions like this, automatically rule out what you know is not right. We know it's not to remove liability from the clinic. That's not what an incident report is for. And we can't document patient response. You know, that's not the purpose of the incident report um, to, to document patient responsibility. That has nothing to do with it. But we do fill out incident reports to, you know, of course, document what happened to keep um, uh, to keep um, a report of any. Um, injuries and things like that to happen in the in the office, but also to avoid future re reoccurrences because, you know, what if it was something spilled on the floor, right? We know, okay, we need to check this. What if it was a cord or whatever, you know? So those are um, um, the reasons. One, to document, of course, and then two, to avoid future reoccurrences. And the reason why it's not D is because it says to create documentation for the patient's medical record. Now, even though we do document in the patient's medical record, that's not the purpose of the incident report. So keyword is purpose of an incident report, okay? The purpose of an incident report is not to create documentation for the patient's record. That's solely for the office, okay? That's for us to keep record of and to make sure we don't do the same thing again. Hey, Veronica. Um... All right, which of the following organs is located in the right upper quadrant? Oh, this is a good one. Gallbladder, spleen, appendix, or stomach? Gallbladder, spleen, appendix, or stomach? The right upper quadrant. You all want to know these quadrants. So um, if you don't already know, you need to know which organs are located in each quadrant, okay? So those of you, you know, you get ready to take this test tomorrow or next week for those of you who told me so. You want to make sure you know these quadrants because you'll probably see this question. The, the nine regions as well. All right, let's see. I'm seeing A, D. I'm seeing A and D. Mostly A and D. Okay, let's see what we got here. 
All right, that's correct. If you chose gallbladder, you are correct. It's in the right upper quadrant, okay? Um, and then the spleen is in the left upper quadrant. Um, the appendix is going to be in the right lower quadrant. And then the stomach is also in the left upper. So the spleen and the stomach are in the left upper, right? Um, also over there with the stomach and the spleen is the left part of the liver and uh, the pancreas, body of the pancreas, right? So you want to make sure you know where, where each of the organs in your abdomen, which quadrant each organ is located in case you see this, okay? So gallbladder, we said in the right upper spleen and stomach we said left upper and then appendix we said right lower okay makeup with Juanita says yes that definitely makes sense okay um let's see when measuring a patient's temperature via the tympanic membrane where should you place the thermometer on the forehead the ear under the tongue or under the arm Temp uh, tympanic membrane where are you putting that thermometer Okay, Let's see A, B, I'm seeing A and B. I'm seeing A and B. All right, let's see. All right, if you chose B, you are correct. So the forehead, that's going to be um, temporal. Under the tongue, um, that is the oral temperature. Um, and then under the arm, of course, that is axillary. Okay. So if you chose in the ear, that is where the tympanic membrane is located. So that's where you're going to place the thermometer. All right. Okay. So which of the following terms is the body's adaptation and change to keep body functions in balance? Is it peristalsis? Is it hema, hematopoiesis, physiology, or homeostasis? If you guys notice, I've stuttered on a few of these words. You got to forgive me. I've been, they, my school has had me on the administrative side for uh, for about, well, almost two years, well, a year and a half now. So I'm, I'm getting, you know, back into the clinical side of things. So yeah, forgive me. Peristalsis, hematopoiesis, physiology, or homeostasis. All right, I see mostly D. Let's see. Let's see if you chose D, you are correct. So let's talk about these other ones. All right, so peristalsis, what is that? That is the process um, during digestion when the stomach is contracting and um, helping to break down the food. And then hema, we already know that hema means blood, right? So we know this one has to do with the blood. So um, hematopoiesis, that's going to be um, the body. That is how the, the process of the body um, creating more red blood cells in the red bone marrow. Um, and then physiology, we know, is the study of the body's functions. All right. So make sure you make notes of those in case you didn't know. All right. Which of the following is within the scope of a medical assistant? Administering IV medication, removing sutures from a healing laceration, interpreting a 12-lead EKG, or identifying whether a skin lesion is malignant. Is within the scope of a medical assistant. All right, I see mostly B's, I see a C in there. All right, let's see. All right, if you chose B, you're correct. So as medical assistants, we can remove sutures. So of course we can't place them, but we can remove them. Um, a, oh, good question. Andre said, why not A? 
So A is not the correct answer because nurses and also providers, they are the ones that can administer IV medication. That's outside of our scope. That's why it's not A. Now, I will say this, and I mentioned this on my externship video, um, the do's and don'ts of externship. I've had people who work as medical assistants to tell me that they have been taught to do so and that they are performing this duty on their jobs. Now, that is outside of our scope. If you are operating outside of your scope and something happens and the doctor is sued, guess what? He or she is not liable for you because you're acting outside of your scope. Okay, so it's very important that you stay within your scope. As long as you're within your scope, let's say you're given an injection and you do something wrong, you draw some or you draw blood. Anything that you're doing within your scope and something happens, you make a mistake and the, the patient sues the doctor. Guess what? The doctor's insurance covers you. But if you're outside of your scope, you will not be covered. Um, I know we can't give IB, but can't we put administer a medication? Um, but can't we put administer, administer medication in an IV? No, we're not supposed to administer IV medication at all. That is outside of our scope. Um, now, you if you're working somewhere and they're and they're allowing it, yeah, Veronica says correct. You are responsible for your actions. If you are. And let me say this as well. I know that each state has different things. I know like somebody, one of the one of you all, I uh, think it was New York. You told me you live in New York and you can't give injections. And so I know things change depending on the state. Um, but those are one of those universal things that um, medical assistants are not to be administering IV medication. Um, Kimberly said, what of the, what of the RN is standing there? It's, you're still doing it. If you're the one doing it, you are technically, you're still outside of your scope. So if the RN is standing there, then she or he needs to be doing it. It is outside of our scope. Now, I do know many people that know how to do it. Like I know how to do it from learning. You know, I was in school. They taught us, they showed us how to do it. It's pretty easy, but you know, that's not, that's not something that we're supposed to be doing as medical assistant. Uh, with IV medication, it's very dangerous. You guys know when you're giving IV medication, you are um, administering medication directly into the person's, into the patient's vein. And because of that, if something happens, we are not trained to administer medication to reverse the effects of that medication. I say the patient has allergic reaction or something like that. We are not trained to, you know, to, um, to administer the necessary medication. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why many medical assistants go on to become nurses because they get out there and they realize that they want to be able to do more, you know? Um, so, you know, um, Kimberly says, what if the R, oh no, I answered that. Um, Vampy says in New York, we cannot give any type of IV or any other injections. Yep. Injections in New York. Exactly. IV across the board injections in New York. Veronica says she's in New York as well, outside of our scope. She's staying to watch the RN, but this, but it's not allowed to do it exactly. To me, I work in rheumatology. She gives injections. Kimberly um, says, then what do I do when this occurs? What do I say? Oh, are you saying that um, they have you doing it? So I will remind them, Kimberly, that's a good question. Because like I said, um, I have, I've had students tell me on externship that they were asked to do things outside of their scope. You need to talk to somebody because at the end of the day, you will be liable because if they if something happened and they came to you and, you know, and you're like what well, they asked me to do it, you knowing that that is outside of your scope, you're responsible for that. Yeah. So, you know, and 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 let's be honest, these people are, are human. Some people, they want to make their job easier. So, of course, they'll have you doing things that um, that you may not be able that you're not supposed to be doing. And I'll tell you guys this and then I'll go to the next question. I'll tell you this real quick. Um, years ago, the the company I was working for, they had CNAs working as medical assistants. And do you know when we end up getting bought by a bigger company, they came through and they did a sweep and they got rid of all of those CNAs that were doing medical assistant work. Why? Because it was outside of their scope. Even though the 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 CNAs they had learned how to do. Um, injections and they had learned how to draw blood and stuff like that. They weren't supposed to be doing any of that. So yeah, they could do it, but it was outside of their scope. And so 
that company came through and let all of those CNAs go. And so you just want to just always make sure you're within your scope. All right. So let's go to this next question. When administering cough syrup to a patient, which of the following actions should you take? Shake the bottle vigorously. Keep the label side of the bottle um, on the bottom when pouring. View the medication cup at eye level when pouring. Or match the mark for the medication dosage to the upper edge of the meniscus. Tamia said, wow. Yep, Tamia, that happened. We had CNAs doing MA work and yep, um, they did a sweep and they fixed all of that. I mean, it was unfortunate for those CNAs that had been working because they were out of a job, but um, technically that company never should have um, been working like that anyway. They should not have had those CNAs doing medical assistant work. Just like Nurses should not have medical assistants doing RN work, right? And there's a lot of things as medical assistants we can do that nurses can't do, but those are just a couple things that we're not supposed to do. IVs and then certain type of medications, even certain type of oral medications. All right, so let's see. Mostly everybody's saying C. Let's see if that's correct. All right, yep. If you chose C, that's correct. So A is not the answer because... um. You don't have to shake the bottle vigorously. It's cough syrup. You don't have to do that. Now, if you were, it was like a liquid medication that you had to mix or something like that. And this type of medication that settles at the bottom, then you would have to shake it and make sure it's, you know, evenly distributed throughout the bottle. But with cough syrup, you don't have to do that. Now, B, this is very important because um, when you all are out there and you're pouring any type of solution, medication or whatever, you want to always make sure you got the label side up. Okay. You don't want the label side down because when you're pouring, if you notice, sometimes a little bit can spill out down the bottom. And if you do that, you can actually pour too much medication. Like over time, that medication will end up um, destroying the label and you won't know what you're pouring. So if you have maybe a solution that you're pouring, um, a medication or whatever, and it's a multi-use bottle, over time, if your label is not facing up, you can destroy that label with the liquid, okay? And then D, match the mark um, at the upper edge. You're actually, you actually want to be, um, when you're measuring medication and you're looking at that meniscus, you actually want to be at the base of the meniscus, not the upper edge of it. That's how people mismeasure when they're drawing up medications. You know, you want to make sure you're at the base of the meniscus, not the, not the, not the upper edge. All right, which of the followings outside another scope of practice question? Which of which of the followings outside of the scope of the medical assistant? Perform clinical duties or additional lab tests, provide directions to a patient about prep for a diagnostic test or reinforce instructions about medications and special diets. I think after this, I'm going to quickly go back to that other scope question because we spent so much time talking about the IV that I didn't look at those other options. So I do want to quickly go back there just for a second after we um, look at this one. So I just want to make sure you all understand. Um, so yeah, outside of the scope, I see mostly B, I see C. This is outside of the scope. All right, let's see. All right, you chose B, you are correct. So let's look at these options. So perform clinical duties under the direct supervision of the provider. Yes, you're under his direction or his or her direction, right? A direct supervision, right? Provide directions to a patient about prep. Yes, you can give them directions. You can also reinforce instructions that the provider has already given them. You're not gonna give the instructions, but you're reinforcing it. Whenever you see reinforce, um, instructions or reinforce the teaching, which you all will see on some of these questions. That just means that you are reiterating what the doctor already told them. Okay. But we can't order additional lab tests to confirm a patient's condition because that falls under treating the patient. If we go into treating the patient and it's as serious as not even being able to give advice. So you want to talk about scope. We can't, we're not even supposed to give advice. Why? Because it falls under treating the patient. So you can't just decide to order tests because guess what? You're ordering, I'm sorry, you're acting outside of your scope, okay? Now, you can put the the the, tet, the labs in. So if the doctor says, hey, I need a CBC on Ms. Jones in room four, 
you can go into the system and put the order in, but you can't actually order. Um, let me just go back really quickly. Um, okay, so, okay, administer IV, we talked about that. Um, interpreting the 12 lead EKG. So we can perform the EKG, we can do the EKG. And even though you all learn to, to interpret the EKG a little bit, you know, we learned the basics of, of interpreting EKG that is technically outside of our scope to interpret it and say, yeah, this patient has this going on, okay? We have to learn it, you know, to be able to recognize certain things, but that is outside of our scope. And then of course, identifying whether skin lesion is malignant, malignant, meaning cancerous, that is the provider's job that is outside of our scope as well, okay? So I just wanted to make sure I went back there because we spent so much time on that IV question all right. Um, so as a medical assistant, Andre says, so as a medical assistant, can I work in a lab for lab core? If so, what's the point? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can definitely work in a lab. So you can draw blood, Andre. You can draw blood. You can do finger sticks. So I worked for lab core years ago and we did a lot um, as a um, as a phlebotomist with lab core. We drew blood. We did finger sticks. We did, you know, babies came in. We did heel sticks. Um, people came in for for um for drug testing. Um, yeah, we 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 I mean it was primarily drawing blood all day, but there were other things too. So yeah, it is it's you definitely if you want to become a phlebotomist, definitely go for it. You just can't do IVs. If you want to be able to do IVs, then you can go on to, you know, you can become a nurse, you know, you can go on to 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 um um, even if you don't want to go to RN route, you know, there's still classes for LPN. You know, a lot of people say LPNs are out of date, but you, you know, companies are still hiring LPN. So, all right, let's go ahead. Oops, sorry. Where should you place the electro for V4? Is it fifth intercostal space? Left, uh, mid clav clavic clav clavicular. Sorry, guys, I know I can't talk. Um, the fourth intercostal space, the left sternal border, the left mid axillary line, lateral to V5, or the anterior axillary line, lateral to V6. He says, but you're not a phlebotomist, you are a medical assistant. So what's the point? Um, so, oh, of, of becoming a phlebotomist if you're a medical assistant. So some people decide to also become a phlebotomist because, first of all, I would tell you this, at my last school, that um that certification was offered and i always tell my students whatever certification you can take get it if, if you have access to it just get it. it makes you more marketable why not um but some people they just want to focus on phlebotomy so some people even though they learn how to draw blood as a medical assistant you know um they decide that they want to focus on phlebotomy so they go on to become a phlebotomist you know in some jobs they want you to actually be certified in phlebotomy so some jobs they don't want someone who's just a medical assistant. They want an actual phlebotomist because the phlebotomist, even though, even though, excuse me, even though you learn phlebotomy as a medical assistant, when you take the phlebotomy class, you actually go a little bit more deeper. Like you learn more about the blood, right? And things like that. So that would be the point of that if you want to get deeper into it. All right, let's see. So the answer is going to be the fifth in the costal space at the left mid clavicular line. That's going to be, um, hold on one second. I mean, I'm still here, but I just need to um, put my phone on the charger really quickly. I'm sorry. Don't want to have any other issues. Okay. All right. So the fifth in the costal space, the left mid clavicular line. And just to let you all know, I do have a video on this channel that goes over each of the placements on the chest. I didn't do the legs and the arms because those are pretty easy, right? So I just wanted to focus on the chest leads because that's what people struggle the most. OK, so the fourth intercostal space on the left side of the sternum, that's actually V2. OK, so that's V2. That B would be V2, the fourth intercostal space. And this is another one. Ladies, gentlemen, you want to make sure you're studying this. OK, make sure you know where um, these um, leads go, these electrodes go. OK, um, and then uh, the mid axillary line. Um, Lateral to V5, that's actually going to be V6. So the left mid axillary line, that's going to be V6. That's lateral to V5. And then the anterior axillary line, lateral to V6, that's going to be V5. Okay. 
So if you have not already checked that video out, I'll link it somewhere around this video. Check that out because you will see, of course, if it's on a practice test, you'll see questions about it. But I just wanted to reiterate it. Um, Raquel, am I saying your name right? Raquel says, what state are you in? I'm in D.C., Raquel. Um, what state are you in, Raquel? Remind me. I think you said it at the beginning, but I forgot. All right. Okay, what action should you take if a patient reports getting a bill for services she didn't receive? You're going to review that day's encounters to determine if another patient received the services, instruct the patient to pay for the services to avoid collections, ask the provider to write the charges off, or determine if the patient has a previous balance. So she came in and she's like, look, I got this bill. I did not get this service. Overkill's in um, North Carolina. What do you want to do? Okay, I'm seeing A and D. All right, let's see. All right, so let's talk about this for a second. So she got a bill. She did, She's like, I didn't receive that. So you want to look at that day because what probably could have happened is that somebody somehow could have mixed her up with someone else. So you want to first start there and see, okay, well, why did she get billed for this service? Because somebody else possibly have got that same, um, got this procedure and we billed it for the wrong person. So you want to check the encounter forms for that day, okay? that day that she was there. Um, we definitely not going to have her pay for services. So B, I'm sure we all could rule that out right away, right? Instruct the patient to pay. Well, we can't make her pay for services that she's saying she didn't get. Now, ask the provider to write off the charges. Um, that, that's not something that the provider would do anyway. That's something if we realize that that patient really did not um, get it, get that procedure done or have that services done, then we'll remove that from her from her um from her file now a write-off is more so when a, a patient actually does owe but we pretty much like forgive them for that for that um for that charge right we'll write it off the provider will write the charge off okay determine if the patient has a previous balance now that had a patient having a previous balance has nothing to do with whether she should get billed for that service or not so questions like this is going to come down to again looking at each one somebody made a comment earlier i think it was tamia and she said make sure you read each question carefully before you hit submit each answer carefully this is one of those questions because i could see how it could be a tricky one right you're like wait a minute why though you know so this is why you just want to read each question carefully and just think about it b like i said i'm pretty sure we all could look at that and know we can't have her pay for that if she's saying she didn't get it the other ones you probably kind of had to think about a little bit and then you want to go, of course, after you do your elimination, then you want to go with the best possible answer when you have questions like this that you just like, okay, I'm lost. Um, Andre said this was on a practice test. It was on his practice test. Yeah, this material, I have access to the NHA study guides and practice tests. So this is where I get this material from, Andre. Linda says your sessions are helpful. Thank you. She's from Indianapolis. All right. She's taking her exam in August. All right, Linda. Glad, glad to know. Um, Kimberly Little says, um, how do I reach you, Miss Kate, on Facebook? I can um, do me a favor, Kimberly, and let me put my email here. I can actually search you on Facebook, Kimberly. Let's see. I'm going to put my email here. You can send me your um, Facebook information, Kay. What is my... Um, Okay, kheartcpr at gmail.com. Lovely say Indianapolis in the building. Okay. All right, which of the following actions should you take if a parent calls in reporting that her child has ingested a household cleaner? You're going to tell the parent to call back after obtaining the child's vital signs, instruct the parent to administer syrup of Epicac to the child, Direct the parent to manually induce vomiting, or are you going to contact, have her um, contact the local poison control center?
All right, let's see. So if you chose D, that's correct. So um, everything else, as, as you're talking to the local poison control center, they may have you do some of these things, but um, you want to definitely first start with calling them and have them tell you they want to have the parent to, to check the patient's, you know, pulse if the patient, if the parent is able to do that, check the patient's pulse or, you know, check the baby's pulse or whatever, or the Serpa Ipecac, that's if that's given to the child, but um, direct the patient to manually induce vomiting. They they could possibly, you know, um, have you do that, but you definitely want to start with calling the local poison control center and have them um, will make sense, but why not call 911? Well, first of all, the poison control center, they're going to be more equipped to handle that. Now, I would say you can simultaneously call 911. Like if you call Poison Control Center, maybe somebody else. And, and it kind of depends on the severity too, Andre. So if you had somebody that's just passed out, I will call, I will call both, to be honest. I teach CPR on first aid and that I've told people to do that in the classes. And that's not an AHA guideline. This is just me saying it. What I would do if this was my child and if she was like passed out or something, I would definitely call both. But if it's a situation where, you know, the child is okay, she's still, you know, functioning, she's responsive and stuff like that, then you may not have to call 911. In the local poison center, they are equipped to handle pretty much anything that you could have got a hold of. They're, they're equipped to handle those type of emergencies, right? Okay, so that's why you want to call, start with them first. But like I said, if, if the person was, you know, passed out or something like that, unresponsive, I would, I would simultaneously call both. Because even if you call 911, EMS may not necessarily be equipped to handle um, the that emergency if, if the child or person was exposed to something that they're not equipped for. So, all right. When initiating a referral for a patient, which of the following should be included? Diagnosis, current medications, age, or family history? You're welcome, Kimberly. You gotta, you're initiating a referral for a patient. You got to send them to a specialist. Which of the following should you include? A diagnosis, current medications, age, or family history? Which should be included on that referral? We are going so late tonight, y'all. That that those technical difficulties really, really um let's see. I think we only got a few more though. So I won't be keeping you too much longer. All right, let's see. I'm seeing the mix. I see B, I see A, I see C. Let's see. So on a referral, it's going to be the diagnosis. Okay. So it, on the referral, because when you're sending them to a patient, that 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 specialist, I'm sorry, so not to a patient, to a specialist, that specialist is going to see you on a referral why that patient is being sent. Medications, age, family history, those things will be included in the patient's history, their chart, right? But it's not necessary for the referral, okay? All right, a patient receives a bill for an x-ray he had due to an injury at work. He has private insurance, but is eligible for workers' comp. Who is responsible for the payment? The patient, the patient's private insurance, workers' comp should pay in full, or part of it should be paid by his insurance and part of it should be paid by workers' comp. He got a bill. He got an x-ray. He was injured at work, had an x-ray, and got a bill. Who should be responsible? All right, let's see. All right, C is correct. And let me just say this. Simply, when a person has workers' comp, we don't need their insurance. We don't need their money. The workers' comp is going to cover that. If you have a patient come in and they have workers' comp, you don't even collect their private insurance. And we had a situation years ago at the cardiology office I was working at. The front desk um, checking in collected the private insurance as well, and somehow her insurance got billed instead of workers' comp. And, and a lot of times they will start a completely different chart for the patient. When a patient comes in, let's say the patient is a regular patient. Normally he uses his insurance, but this time workers' comp is paying for it. In some instances, 
they may even start him a whole new chart. Why? Because when workers comp is paying for it, they his his company has a right to his records. So if he doesn't want all of his records to be, you know, um, he doesn't want them to have access to all his records, then that's why a lot of times they would start a whole new chart. At, at least we did at the practice I work for. We started in a completely different chart. So that way that company wouldn't have access to the rest of the information. Pay by private insurance. Nope. Again, we're never going to collect their insurance. Um, that patient, like I said, her insurance was billed and it should never have been billed. All right, which of the following instructions is correct when reinforcing teaching to a patient who receives suturing of a laceration? Don't attempt to change your dressing until the next visit. Be sure to call your provider if you have a fever over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep the dressing damp so moisture can surround the wound or red streaks near the wound are normal and can be addressed at your next visit. I'll take a moment, let you all read that. So the person had a laceration, they had a cut, and they had to get it sutured, a.k.a. they got stitches. All right, let's see. It looks like everybody chose B, and you're correct. So we definitely don't want them to wait to change it. They need to be able to change it. That's something we'll show them how to do before they leave, how to change it, right? We don't want it damp. We want them to keep it dry and clean, okay? And then red streaks, that can indicate um, infection. So no, that is not normal. A fever over 100 degrees, red streaks, both can um, imply or suggest that it's, infect it's infected, okay? So we want to call if the fever is over 100 degrees. Which of the following EKG artifacts is caused by a disconnected electrode? A wandering baseline, AC interference, an erupted baseline, or a somatic tremor? EKG, um, which of the following EKG artifact is caused when the electrode is disconnected? So you doing the EKG, it's disconnect all the time. You're doing the EKG and you're thinking it's on there. The whole time it's not. All right, I'm seeing, let's see. I see a couple of Bs. I'm seeing mostly C. All right. Oops, I went backwards. Okay, so if you chose C, you are correct. So wandering is usually caused by if the electrode is either poorly attached or maybe the patient is moving. Um, AC is usually from like electrical currents nearby. Um, and then um, somatic tremor is usually by muscle movement, okay? So usually by um, maybe if, if a person has had like muscle spasms or something or if a person is moving a lot. Um, that can cause a somatic tremor artifact as well. All right. Which of the fall? Oh, I went back again. Sorry. Um, when using the Snelling chart to test visual acuity on an adult, the assistant should have the patient stand which of the following distances away? 10 feet, 20, 14 inches, or 30 inches? All right, let's see. So it looks like everybody pretty much knew that one. That's 20 feet, yeah. So the other, the 14 to 30 inches, in some instances, um, you may have to measure a patient that close, but it's going to be 20 feet if you're doing the visual acuity on an adult. Um, 10 feet, like if you have a small child, then you may have them do um, 10 feet away. If they're like under like five, then you may do the, um, you might do the 10 feet. 
All right. Which of the following instruments should be available for a general physical exam? Forceps, autoscope, curette, endoscope. Another one where you want to make sure you know how you recognize these, you know, instruments. And I don't want to say it like this question is more important than others. Every question is important, but this is just another example of um, making sure you understand what these instruments are for. So just in case you see it acts differently than you know it. Okay, so I'm pretty much just seeing B. Let's see. Yep. Autoscope, you all chose B and you're correct. So forceps, those are going to be used for like grasping and clamping. So doing procedures, right? So that's not needed for general physical exam. Um, Caress are used for removing foreign objects, right? Or with um, GYN exams. And then the endoscope. Um, that is used to view um, uh, in, um, uh, organs, right? So endoscope, they'll go in through the throat and they'll go in and, you know, it's called an endoscopy where they'll go in and look at, you know, whatever they, they look looking to, if they're looking at maybe your um, stomach and things like that, they'll go in um, with a little camera. That's the endoscope. It goes in, goes in to see your, um, to get a visualization of your organ or cavity. All right. Which of the following medical records is a patient entitled to? Detail psychotherapy notes, list of medications with diagnosis, original x-rays, or information compiled for legal proceedings? The patient is entitled to these records. All right, let's see. Looks like everybody said B and you are correct. You are correct. So um, even though patients, you know, they can always request copies of their records, they're not going to get the actual detailed psychotherapy notes, right? They'll probably get, they'll get, not probably, but they, they'll get like a summary but usually doctors, they don't want the patients to see their actual notes, okay? Um, original text x-ray, chest x-rays, no, they'll get copies of it, not the originals. And then the information compiled for legal proceedings, um, that's not something that a patient is entitled to either. So information that I say something is going on in um, legal proceeding can be maybe the patient suing a doctor or whatever, any type of legal proceeding, the information that is being compiled, the, the patient doesn't, is, is not entitled to that information, right? All righty, let's see. I think we got a couple more questions. At what time of day will a patient's body temperature be at its lowest? The af late afternoon, before bedtime, in the morning, or midday? When will it be at its lowest? Alrighty. Looks like everybody chose C in the morning. That's correct. Late afternoon, bedtime, midday, those times of day that tends to be actually higher. So you're correct. In the morning is when the temperature tends to be lowest. Listen, we got to the end. Congratulations. Y'all made it to the end with me. Thank you all, everybody that have been on here the whole time. We, for those of you who just joined or maybe, you know, um, only joined when, when this video went live, we were actually on a whole other video. My computer started acting up and it just, it was, we were on, I think for at least probably already 15 to 20 minutes. So y'all been on for a long time with me, everybody that was on the other video. Thank you all for hanging in there. Do me a favor. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and exit out the chat and like the video for me. Do that for me, please, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you do so. Continue to share the videos with your classmates and your colleagues. Let me know um, quickly while I'm on here. If you have any questions real quick, let me know quickly. You can put it in the chat. You're welcome. Lovely said, thank you so much, Queen. We appreciate you. No problem at all. Um, Charmaine, good question when I be going live again. I'll be honest, Charmaine, I don't plan these. I have so much going on. I had some time this week 
to work on this. And so I just kind of, I don't really plan it. Whenever I get time, I do it. I don't know. I have a new class starting next week. Um, it was pushed. It was supposed to start um, a couple weeks ago. They pushed it. Um, and so I have a new class starting next week. So it kind of depends, Charmaine, just whenever I get time. But I will definitely be doing a part five. Eventually, I just don't know when. Andre's test is July 21st. I wish you the best. Somebody said they're taking their test tomorrow. I can't remember who that was, but I wish you the best tomorrow. Chris was taking hers on Saturday. Okay, she says she's going to watch the videos on replay. Okay, perfect, Crystal. Let me know how you do. Once you finish, let me know. Um, you're welcome. Everybody's welcome. I just want to see if there's any questions before I end this live. Just make sure you subscribe and like the video, share with anybody. I've been getting a lot of comments of people letting me know that they've been sharing it with their classmates. So that's good to know. Um, are you able to send us something? Yes. Yeah, so lovely. Yes. Yeah, so what I do, um, I post on the page, uh, I post on the, um, in the community tab when I'm going live and then, um, I will be posting those medical assistant groups. I think a couple of people are here from the medical assistant groups. I'll post there as well. And the medical assistant groups, just keep in mind, it's not my groups. These are just medical assistance groups that I'm a part of. One of them is called um, CCMA, Certified Medical Assistant, Certified Certified Clinical Medical Assistant. The other group is called, um, um, what is it? Um, medical Assistance with Experience Network. I'll link those below. But those are the groups that I'm talking about when I talk about the the. Um, the Facebook groups. They're not my groups, but they're groups that I'm a part of. Oh, so Lovely says she's watched one through three over and over. You're welcome, Patrika. She says, um, thank you for this video. My exam is next week, Wednesday. And this was a great, awesome, Patrika. I can't guarantee it, but if I'm able to do a live again before then, I will, but I can't guarantee it because um, my schedule is kind of all over the place. Um, but Lim says she'll be re-watching. Okay, yes, her test is next Friday. So Veronica says she's always mentioned the videos. Thank you, Veronica. Crystal Andre said he wishes you the best. All right, so I'm going to get ready to get out of here. We went way over time tonight. Thank you all for hanging in there. Um, Veronica said, I'm glad you started clinical again. Me too, Veronica. I do kind of miss the clinical side. I've been on administrators. I teach both, but um, I've been on the administrative side. So my schedule is changing because I'm not able to teach the evening class anymore. So now that I'm moving to the morning, that's what I have. I have clinical. Um, I'll have clinical again in September. So I'm happy to be back. I, I, I kind of, I miss it. I prefer, I've been preferring the, the administrative side because I get to wear regular clothes <laughs> on the administrative side, but I'll be back in my scrubs again, um, in the fall in the lab. Oh, Natasha is the one that says she takes her test. Mom, please let me know how you do, Natasha. Make sure. Oh, one thing I want to mention too, as you all were watching this video, if you happen to notice that a lot of this stuff you didn't know, if you notice that, okay, I'm struggling with this, make sure you double down on those areas. So Natasha, you know, as you was watching this, I hope that it was helpful, but make sure you, any areas that you recognize that you maybe struggle with, double down on those areas tonight. Um, um, and then just make sure, you know, you look over your notes again, those ranges, make sure you know those ranges, make sure you know, make sure you can, you know, convert pounds to kilograms, all that good stuff, Celsius to Fahrenheit, all that stuff, you know, make sure you just look at that stuff again. Um, there's not a lot of math on there, but you will probably see that. Um, and what else? And, and um, terminology, of course, being able to recognize certain words and stuff like that. And so, you know, you got this. Let me know tomorrow as soon as you take it. What's your question, Andre? I see you say you have a question. I'll wait for it for a couple seconds. Lovely said good luck to everyone who's taking their exam. Good night, Veronica. Veronica also says good luck. Oh, he has an interview tomorrow at a hospital. No, don't wear your scrubs to, um, to an interview. Good question, though. I will tell you this. Now, sometimes... I've had students who um, were called for interviews by the externship site. So I've had students who, you know, they get their externship site and then the externship site will say, hey, can you come for an interview right now? And they're like, I'm in school. I'm in my scrubs. They'll say, well, come on, come on in your scrubs. 
unless they tell you to come on in your scrubs, don't wear your scrubs to an interview. Dress professionally, Andre. If you don't have a suit, you know, um, you can always wear like a nice button up, you know, and some slacks, but do not wear your scrubs. That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. Even though you'll be wearing scrubs, you know, when you're working, do not um, wear them in your interview. Unless, like I said, they tell you to. Raquel said it's more clinical on there than anything. Yeah, this is, yeah, for, so the CCMA is more clinical than anything. Yep. Yeah. So you'll see some administrative questions and stuff, but like we did, like you see how we saw a few administrative questions, that's how the, the CCMA is. You got to know how to, you know, make an appointments and things like that and recognize certain administrative questions, but it's more clinical. This is why I love the CCMA because as a clinical medical assistant, when I had to take this test again, after years of not being certified, it was easy for me because I've been working in the field. And so, you know, a lot of the questions are scenario questions. So in my opinion, and don't quote me, I believe that the CCMA is easier um, than the CMA and RMA. Now, don't take that as facts or 100% true. That is just my opinion. I believe the CCMA is easier, especially for those of you who have not been certified for a long time, but you've been working. Um, lovely says so informative. Miss K knows her stuff. I love it. Oh, thank you, lovely. Um, 383, Miss. Okay, got you. So you were close. You know what I say to that? Even though I, I know it sucks because you were so close. Um, but I will say because you got so close, at least you know you can do it. You know what I mean? So it, and it sucks when you're so close and miss, but. The, the, I always like to look at the glass half full, right? Instead of half empty, you made it so close. So guess what? That means those seven points, you can go back in there and, and just knock it out the park. You really can. So that's the good thing. She said, Ms. Veronica said, would you say that CMA has more medical than clinical or vice versa? I think CMA, oh yeah, you know what? CMA, um, both the CMA and the RMA are broader than the CCMA. But I think the CMA is even more broader. So like it's so much more on a CMA that you're going to see than you will see on a CCMA. Yes. Um, it's more it's it's a mix like you can't you, you, you just don't know. It's going to be administrative. It's going to be clinical. It's going to be you're going to see some terminology. You're going to see some phlebotomy. You're going to see some some of everything on a CMA. And that's why I've been telling people who who emailing me, Miss Cam, taking my CMA and watch your videos. That's great that you're watching it. But make sure you're looking at that CMA info, too, because you're going to miss out if you don't. So, yeah, the CMA is more broad. It's so much. And then, you know, the CMA is a five year certification. So you got to think about that, too. The CMA, you know, RMA is three years. CMA is five years. CCMA and CMAA, those are two year certifications. And so when you even when you look at it like that, OK, this CMA, this is a five year certification. So it's most likely going to be a little bit more vigorous than the other ones. I mean, people pass it. I mean, it's, it's still passable. You know, it's still, I've had students pass it. They pass it. They pass the RMA. It's just that um, it's just more broad. So you got to really make sure you're studying the material. Lovey said, you got this, Raquel. Um, why not wear scrubs to the interview? Because you want to be professional. Good question, Kimberly. You always want to be professional. The only way I would wear scrubs to the interview or I tell my students is if um, as I mentioned, the the your they tell you to come on and, and wear scrubs. If you're already at work and they ask you to come in and you tell them, oh, I'm sorry, I'm at work on my scrubs, then, but no, you always want to be professional, always, always. And that's with any job, even though you wear uniforms at the job, you always, you know, it may be a job where you wear khakis and a black shirt. That, that doesn't mean wear that to the interview. You always want to be professional. And it's always better to be professional and you don't need to be as as opposed to you were supposed to be professional and you weren't. I always tell my daughter that it's better to to have something and I need it than to need it and not and, and not have it. So um, you if anything, you want to be extra. So they maybe were expecting you to come casual, but you are dressed up and professional. So, yeah. Um, she saw a lot of the questions on the test that you're going over. Oh, on the actual test or the practice test for Kale? I know the practice test, this is the same information, but the actual test, if that's the case, then that's good. Uh, she said it's helping a lot. I'm so glad. Thank you, Kale. I'm glad to know that. 
that is the point of these videos. So I'm glad to know that it's helping. If, if I wasn't getting told that I was helping and I wouldn't, it would be pointless. So thank you. All right, guys. I know I said I was going to end this. It's, it's almost 11 o'clock. This is the longest we've been on. Oh, the actual test for Carol. Okay. It's the longest we've been on. Good night, guys. Um, Let me know tomorrow. Crystal, if you're still on, let me know ASAP. Go study. All right, guys. Good night.